experience in running any production commissions. We were being a heads of state, uh, and, and now they've struggled with the various challenges they confront. Today we have a very interesting speaker uh, with an interesting background. Martin Bell is our uh, is our speaker this morning. By background, he's an international reporter uh, with the, the BBC. Has covered, uh, I think he said, 18 wars uh, and. Numerous, and that doesn't include various other kinds of uh, domestic battles. I think he missed the big fight between my sister and myself a few years ago. Uh, but it worked, it has worked in and visited 103 countries, so I'm sure he's probably been to everybody's, uh, everybody's homeland in South Louis today. But in uh, the late 90s, there was some bad behaviour by some of the politicians in the British Parliament. Now we remember the very bad behaviour that was exposed a couple of years ago, but several years before then, there was some bad behaviour as well. And Martin was coaxed uh, to a civic duty of running for Parliament against one of the most odious characters in the British Parliament at the time. You remember I mentioned yesterday about safe seats. Well, this gentleman occupied the safest seat for his party. I mean, basically a job for life. And uh, what happened was public outrage was such that Martin was actually elected. And he did not have a party. He stood as an independent, which was another very rare thing in uh, British politics. But there were discussions that took place around that. He worked from inside the parliament to try to make some changes. Uh, but I won't go on. I will let Martin to uh, present his experiences and share with you uh, some ideas and tips that he had on what to do or not what or what not to do uh, in trying to put some standards and integrity in your power. Thank you very much, Mark. Well, those of you who have a nervous disposition should probably leave the room now, because I don't do Latin and I don't do Miles. I haven't lived in not everyone's countries, but most of them, Bosnia especially. We'll discuss that later. The gentleman from Uganda, I once attended one of the Yamin's weddings. He was marrying Lady Sarah of the Mechanized Suicide Regiment of the Uganda Army. Uh, so it's been very light. Uh, and what I want to do, I was just struck when I sent the outline of this course. In paragraph two, it said something like, is corruption so endemic and pervasive that can do so little about it, but just leave it alone and concentrate on other ways of improving civil society? Well, the answer to that is no, no, and no again. Uh, corruption I define in this context as the use of uh, public office for private gain. And MPs who are capable of doing that are capable of doing absolutely anything. Raiding and giving away their country's natural resources, curtailing civil liberties, launching uh, illegal wars, and you don't have to be a failed state to launch an illegal war. Therefore, I'm going to take you this morning on what I call a, a walk on the dark side. So I spent a lot of my life on the dark side. Uh, and they explore the connections between war, wars and, and, and corruptions. We're not, we're not living in compartments here. Everything has consequences. And the law of unintended consequences is a very, is a very savage one. Uh, I'm not and was not a professional politician, except I suppose I did get paid for four years to be a member of the British Parliament. Uh, my principal profession was the one that took me to the dark side. Uh, and I suppose from being a, a young soldier in 1957 to my recent experiences, I'm now an ambassador for Yensef. Uh, and they take me to Somalia and then to Yemen and Iraq again later this year. That's actually more than half a century uh, on the dark side. And I found the House of Commons a very dark side indeed. Uh, and, 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 uh, and I want to get into that. Um, why be interested in politics at all? I was brought up in an old on the one hand this, on the other hand that, I need to stand up for this. On the one hand this, on the other hand that, tradition of BBC journalism. And in fact, I've been looking at some old stuff I did from the streets of Belfast in the late 60s and early 70s, and it was absolutely terrible. Uh, I thought it was rather good when I did it, but I now see it was complete rubbish because I was, I was more or less, I was morally neutral when I shouldn't have been. And out of the Bosnian War, uh, where I did learn a lot, I developed what I call a theory of the journalism of attachment, which is that journalists need not necessarily feel themselves to be neutral between good and evil or between the aggressor and, and the victim. 
And, and, and having said that, I would point out immediately that there was no monopoly of suffering, of evil, or of, or of heroism in the Bosnian War. It was a three and a half year conflict which had the most dreadful consequences. 97,000 people killed, perhaps 2 million driven from their homes. All communities victimized in one way or another. It was both a civil war and a war of external aggression. When it, when it came to the Srebrenica uh, massacre of July 1995, this occurred at a time when there were 30,000 uh, United Nations troops in the country, an organization called UNPROFOR, the UN Protection Force, which did not protect, and those lives could have been saved. And I wrote out, I'm going to quote a little bit from some of my books. Not that they're great books, but they, uh, this one was written in white heat of passion. I'm, I'm not an academic either, you, a lot of you are academics. But this book in its original form not only did not have any footnotes, it didn't even have an index. Uh, I remember completing it as the parachute flares were coming down over the, over the battlefield of the Jewish cemetery in, uh, in, uh, in Sarajevo. And I looked out and I thought to myself, this, this needn't have happened, and I'll get into this later on. Uh, and, I, and I wrote, it seemed to me then, and still does, the trail of culpability for Srebrenica leads, as for the earlier genocide in Europe, not only to those who made it happen, but to those who let it happen. And I quoted Ali Wiesel, the great survivor of the Holocaust, he said, indifference is a sin and a punishment. <coughs> and it connects directly to the wider issues I raise, and which are not much publicly debated, but what risks and casualties were willing to take in the course of peace, and whether our foreign policy should be based only on a calculation of national interest. On the strict calculation of national interests, Srebrenica was none of our business. It did not touch our security, our prosperity, or any of the usual political and electoral nerve endings. It was not the business of any of the countries of the European Union except Holland, and it was in the national interest of the Dutch to get their troops out as quickly and safely as possible, which is what they did. But if you put history into fast rewind and follow this argument back over 50 years, you will see its destination with chilling clarity. Was Buchenwald none of our business? Was Belsen none of our business? Were Auschwitz and Birkenau none of our business? The case collapses under the weight of history and of its own invidiousness. And I wasn't intending then to get into politics, but it sort of prepared the ground. So that when I was approached, I remembered these Syrian experiences of the Bosnian War, and I thought, obviously all wars are failures of diplomacy and politics in some way or another. But it is the best that the, our politicians could do. Uh, I thought there must be something wrong with our politicians. And I never intended to get into Parliament. I never. But it got to me. It reminds me of something that Trotsky said. Trotsky said, you may not be interested in the war, but the war may be interested in you. <laughs> Same with politics. Uh, way back in the early, in early 97, I was completing a television documentary for the BBC about the first six months in office of Kofi Annan, who was a good friend and was then the Secretary General of the United Nations. It was a wonderful assignment. It took me obviously to New York, but to the International Criminal Court in The Hague, to the ICC. No, the ICC it took me to Angola, where I met Jonas Savimbi, the UNITA leader, about two years before he was killed. Uh, and we went to South Africa and met Nelson Mandela. So I was, having, I was having a good time. And I was vaguely aware there was an election building up in my country and it had to, be, it had to happen in the latest May 97. And there was a, it was a time of, of, of sleeves, of, of corruption, both alleged and real, touching mainly, not entirely at that time, about 20 MPs of the then government party, the Conservative Party, <coughs> and the most egregious and, and notorious of these I called Bill Hamilton, who had been taking a lot of hospitality undeclared from Hamid Al Fayed, the, the, the owner of, uh, of Harrods. And Al Fayed claimed that he gave uh, Hamilton £20,000 in news notes and brown envelopes in order to promote Al Fayed's wish to have a British passport. He said that of another MP, a man called Tim Smith, who admitted it. Hamilton denied it. But we also know, now know that in the late 80s, Hamilton, as a member of the Treasury Select Committee, had moved an amendment to the finance bill, this is the bill that enacts the budget, which if it had been passed would have uh, saved the oil companies uh, 70 million pounds in tax revenue. It was a big measure. And he then billed Mobile Oil uh, 
funds with parliamentary service. Now that is using your public office for private gain. I didn't know that at the time. It was the reason why he lost two legal actions subsequently. But anyway, this guy was sitting on a measure of conservative majority of 22,000. And I hope those of you familiar with our, our, our politics, our conservative party is not necessarily the most principled of our parties, but its supporters are intensely loyal uh, to, this, to the party. They'll hold their noses and vote for the party rather than for the candidate. So the then two opposition parties, Liberal Democrats and Labour, realised they couldn't bring Hamilton down by themselves, or even more competing with each other. So they started looking for somebody uh, outside the political spectrum, someone with no political record. And they approached Terry Waite, the rather well-known um, former hostage in Beirut, who actually comes from the village of Tile and they style in the Tatton constituency. He's alleged to have turned it down in the wild eggs and grounds in already so about four year term as a hostage. He didn't want to serve another. So they came in the end to me, I was opening an exhibition of Bosnian war photographs, and somebody looked at me across the credit table afterwards and said, uh, why not you? And I remembered Bosnia and I remembered Srebrenica. And most of the regrets of my life have not been about the things I, I have done, but the things that I haven't, of course, not taken and, and the challenge not accepted. And so I said, well, OK, I'll, I'll go for it. I had not the least idea what I was getting into. It was, it was brilliant. Uh, first of all, my friends in the press turned on me because I had crossed some imaginary line between journalism and, and, and politics. And they went for me. And I thought, I'm only, and of course, then you get your private life uh, examined microscopically. And your, 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 your bin's gone through in the hope of finding incriminating material. And I think that I'm the only politician, political candidate who understood the support of two political parties and both his ex-wives, they were um, And everyone thought I was going to lose. Uh, one of the post Guardian columnists came up and took a look at our campaign and it said, it said, it said it had all the professionalism of a, a Blue Peter appeal. Blue Peter was a television program for kids. Uh, and it was. It was not well organized. It was, it was in the Muslim machine. It was a, it was a contraption. It was not well led, uh, but the people were angry, and I'll get to the lessons of this later on. But the little lessons, when the people are really upset, then that is where the cleansing of corruption comes from. It doesn't come top down; it's bottom up. Uh, and it was only on the last day that I was aware how strong the feelings were. The people felt really let down by their very honourable gentlemen who had been a, a junior minister and had even been spoken of as the future leader of the Conservative Party and then obviously of course uh, Prime Minister. And his own people turned against him. Uh, I thought, because I thought I was going to lose, I made an unwise promise. I said that if they elected me, I would serve them for one term and one term only. But I needed to move 12,000 Conservative votes. And I thought I could do this better if I was offering them a, a one-night stand rather than a, a lifetime of commitment, so to speak. And then on the very last day, the, the campaign colour was white. And suddenly there were white ribbons flying from trees and white balloons. It was, it was, it was very moving. And I knocked on the door of an unfashionable suburb, not normally canvassed by anybody. And a lady of a certain age came out and saw who it wasn't. She said, I've got to go get your teeth in. So she went in and put her teeth in, gave me a big kiss on the lips. And uh, I won that night with an 11,000 vote majority. And that's one of my uh, supporters said at the time. Nothing to do with me, he said, against Neil, Neil Hamilton and Frank Monkey Group. He's probably right. So there I was. Uh, it was quite a scary <coughs> experience. I was uh, the first elected independent for half a century. I had no party to support me. On the other hand, I never had, had no whip to tell me how to vote. I had no constituency association to report back to. Every vote was a, was a free vote. And then I and it was quite difficult. We have a very, our, our parliament is much more old fashioned than, than, than any of yours. I mean, when you actually take your seat, there's a, there's a cloakroom with a, and each MP has his, has his, has his or her own coat hanger. And, and there's a pink ribbon attached to the coat hanger. So I asked one of the liberated servants, I said, well, what's the pink ribbon for? He said, this is where you hang your sword. <laughs> <laughs> The two front benches are at two swords' lengths from each other. 
It's a very adversarial system in which the independent actually has nowhere to sit because there's no, unlike the House of Lords, there's no crossbench. But you have to work out the difference between honourable gentlemen and right honourable gentlemen, honourable and learned gentlemen, honourable and gallant gentlemen. An honourable and learned gentleman is an MP who's also been a, a QC, a senior lawyer, and an honourable and gallant gentleman is an MP who's also been an army officer of field rank and above, that's major and above. And since I've never been on the court, that meant I couldn't be gallant. But a study of German history will tell you that we ex corporals are, are a dangerous bunch. And so I concentrated on two issues beyond the constituency issues. Uh, one was issues of war and peace, because I was the only member of Parliament with recent experience of, of, of present day conflict, not only in Bosnia, but in the Middle East and, uh, and elsewhere. And I thought I couldn't explain or bring up with the Cordite to the debate. And I was even then concerned that we had no, really, no minister or junior minister of, 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 with any military experience. And this can lead Prime Ministers, especially uh, Tony Blair, into the illusion that uh, that problems can be solved by force, which they which cannot be, and that uh, the use the going to war is actually a policy option, which is what he did in Iraq with absolutely uh, disastrous consequences. Uh, and the other issue, of course, was the issue with which I was elected, which was public trust and public life. And I served for three and a half years on the Standards and Privileges Committee, and the, 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 this was set up when these scandals began as an effort to get the House of Commons to regulate itself. There were 11 members on this committee, most of them were Labour. The Conservatives gave me one of their seats, bless them. Um, but what happened was that the, the MPs complained against either by other MPs or by members of the public uh, for having filled their allowances or for having broken the rules in one way or another. The kind of case that came before us was a, a Conservative MP who'd, uh, who'd fallen into debt. He borrowed £10,000 from a, a friend of his and then recommended his friend for a knighthood. I mean, corruption in the United Kingdom takes, take, takes many, many forms. And I'm absolutely not here before you this morning under the illusion that the UK is, is any kind of a model to follow. In fact, to some extent, it's an example for, for, for other politics uh, 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 to, to avoid. Uh, so then these, these cases came before us. The, the, uh, the committee had a, a commissioner for standards who was actually did the investigation for it. And the second uh, commissioner for standards is actually on the, on the board of this organization, Elizabeth Fitton. Uh, and what happened to her is, is, is really interesting. She was, she was already inquiring diligently into the MPs' abuse of their abuses of their expenses and allowances, and she made them very, very uncomfortable. She had very good supporters on the committee. She had me and about one other. And in the end, they, uh, they got rid of her. It was a, it's the time, one of these prime cases of the, of the empire striking back. You know, they don't like it often, and they will respond. And she was let go in February 2002 when somebody much more malleable was put in her place. And this sent a signal to the honorable members that they could so to speak, fill their boots, that they could continue to make, uh, exploit every allowance in the book. What happened with it in the early 80s? The, uh, the, the, there was a black bench rebellion in conservative MPs complaining they weren't being paid very much, which was true. And Margaret Thatcher, the then Prime Minister, told them they could not, in all conscience, vote themselves a substantial pay increase. But look, she said, we get a whole new lot of allowances, like there's a second homes allowance, the alternative costs uh, allowance, which was like a little gold mine for them. Uh, the kind of thing that would happen was an MP would, uh, would uh, complain to his or her second home, which is very often the first home, actually rather a grand place, and any, any dilapidations were then paid for and improvements were paid for. They could then sell that at a profit and switch their second home to another, to another residence. And some of them built up enormous property portfolios, but none of this was known at the time. What was known is that Tony Blair's government, elected in 1997, turned a blind eye to the issue on which it was elected. Uh, some of its um, senior figures came before us repeatedly on this committee. And the junior Labour members of the committee were very reluctant to vote against someone 
who might have control over their over their careers. It's one of the things you get when you've got a, a national assembly of, of careerists rather than rather than people of, 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 of principle. Um, and a few months in, there was a the first <coughs> whiff of scandal in the beginning of '97 when the Labour Party was still in opposition. They'd taken a million pound donation from a man called Bernie Anderson, who runs Formula One racing. And then they'd been in office about three months. And they decided, Tony Blair decided to give Bernie Eccleston a break on the question of whether or not tobacco advertising should be allowed on his, on his race tracks. In other words, the party had received the money and the government had then adjusted its policy uh, to fit its commercial interests. So this was a clear case of institutional corruption. And I got up one day and I asked, is the Prime Minister aware that the appearance of wrongdoing can be as damaging to public trust as the wrongdoing itself? Or have we slain one dragon only to have another take its place with a red rose in its mouth? The red rose, the symbol of the Labour Party. And they didn't like that. And I was then, they, they, I was then subject to a fairly vitriolic newspaper campaign run by a government supporting newspaper, the, uh, the Daily Mirror. The big headline was, How Clean Is Mr. Clean? Well, again, <coughs> it was the people who saved me. They, they backed me. They knew I'd done nothing wrong, and the mere fact that I was being attacked by the Daily Mirror probably did me some good. But one of the things you all know from your own experiences, you've got to have a, a fairly um, thick skin, because the empire will strike back. People will have a go at you. Uh, vital interests and, and, and careers um, uh, are at stake, uh, and they don't like people to take on the status quo politics. We have a rather splendid committee also set up at the time the Conservative Standards called the Committee of, of Standards in Public Life. It's played a very big role in the recent expensive scandal. And uh, its outgoing chairman in 2007, a man called Sir Alistair Brown, summed up the, the, the problem we had. He said, My greatest regret has been the apparent failure to persuade the government to place high ethical standards and, most important, behaviour at the heart of his thinking. And this set the scene of, uh, for what was to follow. In my time in Parliament, I was, uh, I can't tell you how good or bad an MP I was, I'm not for me to judge, but 82% uh, of my constituents in two opinion polls asked me to break my promise to serve for a single term. There were not many people in politics who were approached for keeping a promise. I was, uh, I was described by one of the political correspondents as a fully paid up member of the, of the awkward squad. But anyway, I, I uh, uh, I, I left in 2001, and, and I've been out of politics. Um, I did barely unseat a prominent Conservative MP in 2001, and I very nearly became a member of the European Parliament in 2004. Uh, I spent four, the party was spending millions, I spent £460 pounds of my own money on the campaign. Just had a present on the website and in the newspapers. So I got 93,000 votes. And a lady wrote to me from the constituency afterwards. She said she didn't know I was standing until she saw my name on the ballot paper. And assuming that I must be an imposter, she goes to somebody else. <laughs> well, there we are. And all this came back when, in May of last year, the, 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 the expensive scandal unfolded. A quite extraordinary tale of routine corruption by a very large number of MPs. Now, some of the, some of the, the, some of the things were, were almost laughable, others were quite serious. Uh, there was an MP who actually charged for a, a duck hunt, and this is a kind of a little island you, you, you float in the middle of your, of your lake, so, and, and there's a little duck house there so that the ducks can breed without being molested by foxes. And this is a necessary parliamentary expensive thing. What he didn't know was that foxes can actually swim. <laughs> there was another man who claimed to have his, he lived in a great mansion, and so the taxpayer was supposed to claim for uh, to, to pay for the rebuilding of his, of, his, of his bell tower. There was another one claimed for the cleaning of his moat. Because these were all rather grand people with grand palaces, this reinforced this great division that we have in my country and you may well have in some of yours between the politicians and the people, between the government and the, and the government. So to get off, I wrote a little poem about it, which I'm going to, which I'm going to begin with. This is why I said you need to, to have a strong uh, strong nerves to stand. 
Being an honourable member for four years, I mourned the opportunities I lost to install stable lights and chandeliers and tennis courts complete with air repairs, to lay wind and carpet on the stairs, to add some new cattle's dining chairs, accountants fees for trading shop stocks and shares, and wreaths for the remembrance Sunday prayers, plus free pork pies and crisps and chocolate spread. And these were things I can thank for. To pay all mortgages, debts and arrears, not at my own but someone else's cost. Instead of representing other people's wills, I could have built up an impressive stash, hundreds of months in supermarket bills, and generous amounts of petty cash. My great regret, if anyone should ask it, the most conspicuous error that I made was buying a, a millennium hanging basket. Its colours were of every human shade. We actually had a former foreign secretary, whose name was uh, Margaret Beckett, a serious politician, who over a uh, period of two years claimed for £2,000 taxpayers' money for hanging baskets of potted plants in her constituency home. And I look back and I ask myself, did I ever buy a hanging basket? Well, yes, I did, in my last supper as an MP. And for the, well, it cost me 50 pounds of my money, and for the rest of the summer, it decorated my little constituency home. And when I was away, it was watered by a very kind man from across the road who had family ties to Neil Hamilton, the MP who I defeated. It was thus a cross-party hanging basket. But it never occurred to me that anyone else but I should have paid for it. And it's, it's, it's what they get into their, in what how they get this in their heads, I don't know. We had another MP who had a very prominent, a lot of these people had distinguished records. They were former government ministers. They were, some of them were very good constituency MPs. Sir Peter Figures, the man with the Duck Island, had been prominent in the defense of the military hospitals, which had now been closed down at a time when we really needed them to be open. But they were misusing their allowances on a massive and sometimes conspicuously abusive scale. And, uh, you know, they got their, I suppose they, they got their comeuppance. One of them actually had a problem with garden pests in his constituency home, which was another mansion. And so, they, so the taxpayer was actually being charged for mole traps. Well, like a lot of these they left. Uh, they left for various reasons. They were either deselected or they were tired of being figures of fun or their party moved them aside. But some of them did not, and there were so much more serious uh, breaches of, of, of the rules, like MPs who were charging for, for, for phantom mortgages, that is, they paid off the mortgage, but they were still charging hundreds of pounds every, every, every month in interest. Uh, and these, some of these cases are now coming, coming, before, coming before the courts. And there were two big news stories in the United Kingdom last summer. One was the unfolding of the MPs' expensive scandal, page after page, and the Daily Telegraph every day. And the other was the rising tide of British casualties from the war in Afghanistan. And one of the things I'm trying to make clear to you is that, is that corruption does not exist in an isolated compartment of its own. And there was, a, there was a, an extraordinary discrepancy between the way that MPs were treating themselves uh, and the way that we were treating our soldiers and taking and got involved in the most intensive combat since, I think, since the Korean War. I mean, you know, to an MP, an emergency is a falling out of his constituency association. A former comrade is a member of the same party, former found the expenses system. And the luxury is a £2,000 plasma TV paid for by the taxpayer. To a soldier, a luxury is a bucket of cold water, an emergency is an all arms Taliban attack and a four operating base. And the fallen comrade is just that. One of those bits and pieces you're scraping up from the blown up uh, on the personnel camp. So why why were they connected? Because at this time, one of our Secretaries of State for Defence, the, the the politicians who deploy and equip these soldiers had been charging over a fairly short period of time many thousands of pounds in petty cash without submitting a single receipt. And another one, the most recent incumbent, had engaged in a 